related issue except for those issues which have already been heard by hearings official or are on tonight's agenda as a public hearing. Each person will have three minutes to speak. When you come to the podium, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residents, your ward if you know it. The timer and lights indicate the time you have to speak. A yellow light will come on when you have 15 seconds to complete your comments. The red light indicates the end of your time to speak. I have um, 15 people signed up this evening. Uh, the first one is Mary Salinas, followed by Bruce Blickle. Hi, my name is Mary Salinas. I live in Eugene. My ad I'm talking to the mic, Mary can't hear you. My name is Mary. Oh, there you go. Yeah. My name is Mary Salinas. Um, my address is General Delivery, Eugene, and I still don't know what ward I'm in. Um, Miss Ortiz, the last time I remember being here with you, you said that sometimes you would like to respond to what I say, but I usually am not here when it's time and. I thought I would tell you that it's because I ride buses and about 8 o'clock the buses start looking like pumpkins. Um, I want to talk about homelessness as usual. I'm a spokesperson for the homeless. Um, I just came from a city meeting. We just had it over here and there are a lot of talk about um, animal protection here in the county. So I wanted to say something about that. In the early 1960s, this is a well-worn story, but many people don't know it, a group of people decided to try to help an abused little girl in the neighborhood. Well, they soon found out that there were no child protection laws, but there were animal protection laws. And so they went to the animal books to protect the young girl. And it was after that that uh, we began having child protection laws. But um, I know the parallel doesn't go all the way, but I do not see sick and starving animals on the streets. But I do see sick and starving humans on the streets. And I think that we have still not quite got it together. Maybe it's easier to help animals and humans, but uh, you make me think about that. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Bruce Blickle, followed by Robert Rubin. My name is Bruce Blickle. I live at 302 Archie Street in Eugene, and Chris Pryor is my representative. Honorable Mayor and Eugene City Council members, especially Chris Pryor, approximately five years ago this body intervened on behalf of manufactured homeowners facing expulsion from Hidden Meadows subdivision. Be advised that Hidden Meadows through its on-site manager is taking actions to circumvent your previous agreement. Number one, an increased number of letters falsely claiming property maintenance failures with repeated threats of eviction. Number two, falsely generating weekly drive-by homeowner maintenance failure claims that do not exist about areas of the property not viewable from the street as claimed in their letters and which can only be seen from her neighbor's yard. And lastly, number three, violating our lease agreement by colluding with a hostile third party, our neighbor by accepting a flurry of baseless, uninspected complaints about issues that actually exist in our neighbor's yard but have been deliberately ignored by Hidden Meadows management. Three dogs that howl, howl all hours of the day and night. Feces and urine filled backyard producing odors that requires us to close all north side windows on warm weather days. In addition, our colluding neighbors peer through the privacy opening in our carport, routinely trespass on our property and peer around the corner of our house nearly every day that I work outdoors, cell phone in hand, reporting infractions to uh, Hidden Meadows management. Hidden Meadows' actions and threats caused my family to fear for the next inevitable, inevitable shoot or drop, which is eviction, and perhaps the need for the city of Eugene to reconsider the matter. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Robert Rubin, followed by Irving Weiner. Hello. Thank you for letting me speak. I have news from the future. I live in Waldport. I work here in Eugene. News from the future. President Obama has joined with Rush Limbaugh, other media pundits, and elected officials from across the country in praising Mayor Kitty Piercy and the city of Eugene, Oregon, as they respectfully declined 
to pursue a Federal Transit Authority grant designed to improve public transportation. We've taken advantage of this program where and when appropriate, said a spokesperson from the Eugene Mayor's Office. However, in regards to West 11th Avenue, the costs, financial, emotional, tangible, and intangible, thoroughly outweigh the benefits. It puts this plan out of balance. The obvious displeasure and solidarity of the property and business owners on West 11th Avenue in opposition to the plan was a major consideration. These are vital members of our taxpaying business community. It is their payroll taxes that fund mass transit now. These people are the backbone of Eugene. A lot of these folks have been in business on West 11th Avenue for more than 20 years. This just wasn't fair. Plus, Eugene already has a darn good bus service on West 11th Avenue, and it hasn't nearly reached capacity. An LTD official agreed. We already have excellent bus service on West 11th Avenue. We spent too much time and money trying to figure out how to get and use these federal funds. We lost our vision of LTD's primary mission. We will spend an equal amount of energy on identifying and solving any real problems that exist on West 11th and throughout the city. We will actively explore smaller, more fuel-efficient vehicles and creative routing. We regret having to cut services this past year. However, we cannot adequately fund the system we now have. Eugene's population is too small for this proposed type of mass transit on West 11th Avenue. Also was noted, financing was a factor. The offer of federal funds was tempting. However, when we looked at everything, we realized the city couldn't afford the matching funds. The state's share would come from lottery dollars, and that would probably divert funding from schools or some other worthy program. Plus, the county would lose revenue as the property owners will file for property tax assessment adjustments since their lot sizes will be reduced and devalued. In addition, LTD already runs in the red each year. The disruption of business access during utility reconfiguration and construction could be tragic to some of the businesses. If one West 11th job were lost, this project would be a failure. There was also identified potential for additional expenses and issues of contention, including replacement of utility costs, condemnation proceedings, legal fees, and selective waiving of city-mandated business parking requirements. The Eugene City Council unanimously rejected the West 11th Avenue project. The plan was deemed not appropriate for West 11th Avenue, and in the best case scenario, the benefits would never offset the costs. The council announced rather than Eugene try to use the funds when not appropriate, the funds go to a larger municipality or back to Washington to help bring down part of the budget. Thank you. That's what caught Obama and Rush Limbaugh's attention. Uh, next is Irving Weiner, followed by Jack Rady. Thank you so much. Uh, my name's Irving Weiner. I live at uh, 88500 Green Hill Road, and I work on West 11th Street. And I think that LTD has lost its way and is more interested in enriching itself than, than, than moving the population of, of that it's supposed to do. Uh, EMX may have been the answer for moving students on, from Springfield to campus, but it makes no sense on West 11th. I've been doing business on West 11th for 25 years. Uh, because of the high traffic, that's the reason I moved there. Lots of cars go by. My business grew, so did my neighbors. The reason people are up in arms about this is that it's the wrong type of transportation for West 11th. Uh, the first I heard about this was an article in the Register Guard talking about a European-style boulevard running down West 11th, the gateway to Eugene, going to Veneta, huh? Uh, the next thing I heard, two LTD uh, employees came to my business and told me about the property that they were going to appropriate from me, even though there was no plan accepted. Uh, now, I want to tell you, some of the businesses that are my neighbors, I have a couple, two auto parts uh, stores, two body shops, um, a motorcycle store, uh, Auto mechanics, auto electric, car lots, motorcycle shops, furniture stores, mattress stores, garden centers, pet shops, over 35 restaurants and banks, all of which have drive-in windows. You may see what I'm getting to and why there's a grassroots movement not to uh, allow this EMX to destroy the business on West 11th Street because we're there because of the cars. None of these businesses have... Uh, have people taking the bus to shop at them. Uh, 
And finally, I'd like to say that uh, we had absolutely no input into what this system would be like. The first we heard about it was, was that it was going in there and we were immediately adversaries. I hope that you would reconsider this and, uh, and do something uh, reasonable to the West 11th Street that will uh, provide transportation for the people and not ruin, ruin this business district. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Jack Grady, followed by Bob Macaroni, it looks like. Or Mac Good evening. I'm Jack Grady. I live at 2230 Garfield. Um, I'm in Brother Brown's district. And I'm here to speak about the EMX extension on West 11th. And I understand that it's seen as a wonderful opportunity for the city to get collect some free federal money and do a big project. And that's very attractive in a time like this when the city is screaming for money and every government level is screaming for money, doesn't have enough. I think this would be a poor place to put it. I first became aware of the EMX extension plan when it was discussed in terms of running it down the bike path um, along Amazon Creek in our neighborhood where I walk to work every day. Um, I work just one block north of 11th and cross the street twice a day. Um, basically, I listened to LTD give us long presentations in our neighborhood as to all the features of this program. And it came to me after a while they were trying to sell us something. Um, this was going to be free. It was going to be super zoomy. It was going to be green painted. It was going to be very attractive. It was going to do wonderful things. And I wondered, well, we're cutting back on bus service as it is. Somehow someone is going to have to pay for this. We will get the buses. We will get the uh, fixing up the street. We will get all of that. But running it, the fuel, the driver's pay, the tires, um, that's going to cost something. And that didn't seem to be calculated in there. And I also understand that when a major capital development like this is undertaken, banks will be loaning money to cover the costs until the federal money comes through. Large equipment operators will be getting a nice contract. Maybe some construction workers, hopefully some who actually live in town, will be getting some jobs, which is a great thing. But for the rest of us, we will have less actual bus service. I mean, bus service works well when you have lots of small buses coming frequently. When you have big buses going just a few places very fast, that doesn't really serve most of the population. It's very attractive. It's a big thing to put on someone's resume. We put in this great big project with, look at these buses. They're so futuristic. They're really exciting. But we could tell when they were trying to stick it down the bike path, that this was not really well thought out, um, but it was a sell job. Piles of statistics, piles of documents, all were waved in front of our faces until everybody was glassy-eyed and wondering, you know, uh, I'm sorry, how many trees are on this route and how many are on that and how many, uh, the ridership numbers, the ridership numbers seem to move all over the place. Um, and the statistics appeared a bit watered in places, but it was a sell job. It wasn't a, okay, we We've got the possibility to do this. There are some advantages. There are some disadvantages. It was all advantages. That Thank always you. sounds like someone selling me something. Thank you. Bob Macaroni, followed by Kim Sawyer. Good evening. Uh, that was a real bummer. I had to follow somebody really articulate. So <clears throat> I'm going to uh, say a few words here. Uh, Bob Macaroni, I own the sports car shop. It's in Ward 1. I live in uh, Ferry Street Bridge in a, one of those huge 1,200 square foot houses. So uh, I'm just a regular person here in Eugene. Lived here for 31 years. Uh, good news is I actually hired somebody today or they started their job with me today. And so good news for Eugene and one person in Eugene. So uh, that's what I do. I try to provide those living wage jobs that the council always likes to talk about. Um, been doing it for 28 years. Uh, I kind of feel that this council, not just the council in general, I've been here a long time, watched some crazy things come out of this, the, the political scene here, and it seems to continue sometimes despite what 
the two true people of Eugene in the private sector want to see happen. And so the private sector actually is the one that donates to your charities and supports the arts and really doesn't ask for a whole lot from the community in return other than support for their businesses. Um, we'd like a little support from the council. We're asking for our ability to keep our own property rights. I invested a lot of money in this community in 28 years, and so did all the people behind me. And we're talking millions of, jo of, of dollars and jobs, and it's at the cost of being an entrepreneur. We risk everything we do every time we open the door, and we risk everything we have. And we do that so we can provide these jobs and a better future for us and our community. Um, I really wish that the council will consider that and maybe each time you have a council meeting say what can I do for the private sector today? Okay, If you're going to say what can I do for the Korean company that might bring something in and get a tax break, maybe you'd be better off doing something for the private sector first. All us small employers will outweigh all those huge employers that stay here for five or six years and get the tax breaks. Um, we're not asking you for much. We're not asking you for money. We're willing to support most of your causes. And so we'd like to ask that you don't give our property to LTD. They're going to, they're going to, you know, tell you the dreams you want to hear. That, you know, we're going to have a transit system that will cost nothing more. They will have buses that will run full. And meanwhile, they're cutting 10% of the service here and a few more buses there. Thank you. Thank you. Kim Sawyer is next, followed by Michael Simpson. Hi there. My name is Kim Sawyer. I own a business on West 11th in Mr. Pryor's district. I live in the Ferry Street Bridge area. Um, I want to talk about, big surprise, EMX. We have good bus service on West 11th. I have several employees that use the bus service. Once in a while, I even see a customer come in or go out and take the bus. But if we try to do this EMX thing, we're going to go through two years of construction. We're going to lose jobs. You're going to lose businesses in Eugene. You're going to see bankruptcies. Uh, I'll have to lay off people, and I run a fast food restaurant. In the last two years, I've already lost four positions. And coming off of that, going into something like this, I'll lose three or four more, at least. And when the construction is right in front of my building, I'll close. That's what I'd have to go through. But, you know, the, the, the beginning and the end of it is that we have good bus service on West 11th now. We could go through all that, and at the end of the day, we're going to have bus service that is not as good as what we have now may be significantly worse because we're going to have an express bus that goes by, has a designated lane, but it goes by all these driveway cuts. It's not going to be an express bus. You're going to have customers, little old ladies, little old men, teenagers just getting their license, high school kids, and everybody in between trying to get in front of the buses, behind the buses, the bus is trying to get through them. It's going to be dangerous and it, it won't be effective as a public transit system. All these businesses that are here and all these businesses that have the signs on West 11th are independent business people. They're generally smart folk. They've all looked at the plan before they put the sign up, as I did. I didn't put the sign up when somebody said, hey, you need to put this up. I put the sign up after I looked at the plan and said, this is the wrong plan for my neighborhood. West 11th deserves better. Eugene deserves better. We've lost too many jobs out in that neighborhood to start losing more. That's all I have. Thank you. Michael Simpson is next, followed by Matthew Davenport. I'm Mike Simpson. I live at 131 Briarcliff. I don't know who my ward is. Um, 
I am the Ed Supervisor at Looking Glass New Road School, and I'm here to talk about, I guess, you know, some more joblessness, and mainly amongst teens. Um, Oregon has the third highest rate for unemployment amongst teenagers, higher than, you know, it's higher than uh, the adult rate. Um, there's a lack of even summer jobs. I remember having a summer job, and it was fantastic. I had money in my pocket. But a lot of, a lot of our youth, I work, uh, you know, in a program that works with at-risk, homeless, and runaway youth, you know, sometimes that's a lifeline for them. Um, many of our youth have criminal records and match that with no high school diploma or GED, and they're even at a greater disadvantage for any kind of work. So also, in a, I guess I saw in the several articles in Registered Guard, they talked about, um, you know, just a lack of it nationwide. But again, Oregon is the third highest rate. And they, they miss out on a chance for, um, you know, critical skills and work experience, such as showing up on time, showing up at all, um, expectations, work experience, but mainly, you know, even a chance to fail and learn from that. Um, you know, a lot of youth we see, this, they just don't have a chance. So we created a summer work program this summer. And as one of my, the case managers at New Roads said, uh, you know, more than anything, our youth need job opportunities. And so we created that. Um, Part of the funding went to create three internships at two local um, businesses, and they did fantastic. Um, Twenty different youth participated in our half-day projects, coordinated with Lorna Baldwin, which was a fantastic match, by the way. Thank you, Lorna. Um, I brought Matthew Davenport with me, sitting right next to her, and he's, he's one of the youth that participated in our program, and he'll give his little spiel here in a second. But the pluses of our program was that, you know, overall there was, the feeling was positive. People in the community were always praising and thanking the youth for their work whenever they saw them on the, along the river trails or in the parks. You know, they saw a bunch of youth working, digging, doing all kinds of stuff. It was cool. Um, the youth felt, you know, they gained a, a real feeling of self-worth, self -worth, community involvement, and responsibility. And one of my students who is now attending classes at LCC told me, he says, I can't even sleep past 8.30 anymore. <laughs> and the other thing I learned is that uh, she goes, I can't stop picking ivy off of trees. <laughs> um, funding, due to low overhead and high enrollment during the school year, um, New Road School had a surplus. And we're like, hey, you know what, why don't we put them, you know, why don't we use that money to put our youth to work? And 4 j School District was like, yeah, absolutely, use that money. Um, recent budget cuts will probably end that funding stream. We're currently looking at grants and other ways to create a sustainable youth employment business that hires out to do landscaping projects around the city um, in conjunction with parks and, rec and open spaces, eWeb, you know, other places as well. eWeb, we did do two days at the uh, Sustainable Water Project near the Cuthbert. It was one of the projects that we did. Um, anyway, they wanted us back. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew Davenport, you're next, followed by Carlos Nixon. Hello, I'm Matthew Davenport. Um, I am currently homeless in Eugene. Um, I wanted to talk about the youth program at New Roads. It, it is a really, really awesome program, and it has helped me a lot. I, I'm homeless. I'm trying to get off the streets. Um, unfortunately, it was only through the summer, and I got here in the middle of July. So, um, I, I feel that it would really be a great help to a lot of the youth here, a lot, especially a lot of the homeless youth, to be able to find steady work. Mm -hmm. And I think it would it would um, be a great help for getting those homeless people off the streets, especially the young people here. Um, All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Carlos Nixon is next, followed by Brent Woodridge. Hi. My name is Carlos Nixon. I'm a West Eugene resident. I'm in Chris Pryor's ward. I'm speaking today as a citizen of Eugene and the larger world. Um, for 40 years, I've been a bike and bus commuter. And now I'm primarily bus and occasional scrounged ride and taxi. Um, I'm very much for public rapid mass transit, all of these. Um, anything that helps us decrease our dependence on cars, congest con and congestion and pollution. I grew up in Greater Vancouver, which is a city with a great public transit system. Mm -hmm. And I've enjoyed public transit in many cities from Portland to Amsterdam. 
but not all public transit is a good thing and the WEMX isn't. It's a boondoggle and it's a waste of federal tax dollars, ours, yours, mine, generations to come. Um, it's often said that uh, bus rapid transit has already been improved by the public in Eugene, but I don't think that bus rapid transit has to be this version. The EMX we currently have reduces the number of stops. Um, if we're talking about gaining time, it doesn't require a lot of extremely expensive twiddly construction. You can get a lot of gain in time just by having express buses, which stop only at major stops during the rush hour, and then um, you can save a lot of construction money and um, community destruction. Um, I do have a lot of questions that um, there isn't time for here about LTD statistics. Um, even is EMX really a particular gain in speed? Um, if I understand correctly, they don't release their original statistics or their processing. Um, so I have some very specific questions about uh, a lot of their uh, numbers. Um, when you talk about the West Eugene MX, the question partly is where is it going to? It's not going to anywhere. It's going to a bunch of undeveloped wetlands and farmlands that we would prefer not to have developed. It goes to a Target and a Walmart where if people have their cars, they take them to go shopping. We do need parallel routes going west. As somebody who lives around 15th, I would prefer not to walk um, to a major west going route. I would like to have routes within walking distance. Um, there are supposed to be feeder routes um, on the EMX to Springfield. I understand what really happened was they did take away some routes to help um, support it and the feeder routes haven't actually been supplied yet. I, um, the last LTD meeting that I went to where alternatives were discussed, they talked about um, an alternative that's basically an improving uh, existing transit system and I was fascinated to see that in the papers that were handed out it said that this is, quote, not likely to be eligible. To me when you say something is not likely to be eligible, it sounds like it possibly could be and it also sounds like we haven't asked yet. Um, I think that we should get out there and negotiate for what we really need and want and not waste our money and um, the money of generations to come on something that is simply Thank you. Brent Woodridge is next, followed by George Cole. Good evening. I'm Brent Woodridge, 2700 West 11th, Autocraft, uh, Ward number 7. And um, I think that we need the bus. I do. But I don't think the $200 million that we're about to spend out there is the wisest place to put it. What I think we need to do is put smaller buses, more buses, because I do have people who ride the bus who work at Autocraft, and they've lost their buses. Their buses have been, you know, taken away, so now they've had to walk further or get rides from other people, and, you know, it's, it's been an inconvenience for two of them. So, um, on the other hand, uh, I've lived in Eugene my whole life, and West 11th, since I've been small, I can remember, you know, it's always been the industrial area of Eugene. Always. You know, when you look up from the South Hills and look down, you see the city of Eugene, and then all of a sudden you see all the mills and all the industrial parks. And um, I hear about revitalizing, putting in multi-homes, or uh, apartment complexes and condos. And, uh, you know, everybody that comes out there, you know, it's it's industrial park. Like, you know, you heard earlier, you know, there's motorcycle shops and auto shops and body shops. And um, it's one of those places that, you know, it's you need a car to go out there. Um, if you're going to get people out to Walmart 10 minutes quicker for $200 million, use the Beltline. You know, whip it out. That's why they built it, to get people out around and get it out quicker. Uh, it's where you get to the airport. You know, I mean, everybody can get out there so much quicker. Use the Beltline. You know, it's there's you won't have to take anybody out. Um, it's easy transportation for somebody. People who ride the bus have time. You know, most people have time. They're young kids, um, elderly. Um, you know, they have the time to ride the bus. Um, I understand people who have cars because they need to get somewhere. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. George Cole is next, followed by Don Peck. My name is George Cole, uh, 2760 West 11th. I uh, have property in both uh, 7 and 8. Uh, 
uh, like to make a statement that uh, we are for um, public transit in spite of what uh, the, one of the articles in the letter to the editor said this morning. And uh, what uh, we want uh, is smaller buses and uh, better routes and better service for the people that need them. Uh, just a little bit of history. Uh, I'm sure you're tired of hearing that I was already gored by LTD for $160,000. <clears> I, I still remember it too, and it still hurts. And uh, I don't want to have to go through this again, and I don't want other people to have to do that. And they were going to take the, the property and use it for a park and ride lot. They were going to have 25 of those throughout the city. This is a little bit of history. And the, the lot that they decided on is a lot that's uh, at Fred Meyer's now. And I've been checking that lot uh, ever since this thing has been going on uh, weekly. And there's, from, uh, there's 42 places there, parking spots, and there <coughs> runs uh, three to six. Today there happen to be nine cars there. Uh, that property is off the uh, tax rolls, so it's a total loss as far as the taxpayers go, and it's not uh, achieving what they said it would achieve. So that makes me question uh, the projection that uh, LTD uh, rapid transit is going to bring um, uh, enhanced business to our area. Um, wh where is the example of that? Uh, is it downtown? Uh, it doesn't seem that way. There's uh, positive and uh, negative things to almost any endeavor, and uh, LTD's uh, rapid transit is not a uh, magic carpet. Um, sometimes uh, it enables the people to get around that uh, mandated the, uh, um, what is it called, <laughs> uh, zone, exclusion zone, excuse me. So those are the things that I would like to uh, remind you of. And are you going to move the holes from downtown out west 11th, and are we going to have to fund another community college to pay for it? Thank you. Next is John Peck, followed by Kimberly Gleiton. I'm Don Peck. I'm one of the owners of the property at 2911. West 11th, where Papa Murphy's is located. Uh, EMX claims that the original cost would be funded primarily by the federal government and state government. The newspaper states a cost of 105 million. I've heard figures up to 140 million. EMX has not stated what the need is for this and why the expansion is necessary. The effect of this change as far as PEC investment is concerned, I was told that the expansion is 12 feet on each side of the West 11th. And you've got six feet per sidewalk. So that's 18 feet. If I measure from the curb 18 feet, there's that much distance between the sidewalk and our building. Uh, EMX, when they were explaining the program to me, said we would have five feet. A lot. <laughs> I don't know where it's going to come from. Uh, our property is set up for an EMX station. The station's northern line would be within a foot of the building. Uh, in the removal of the 18 feet, we would lose five parking spots in the parking lot. With the sidewalk as close to the building as they're going to have it, it is more susceptible to vandalism. We've already had vandalism problems. With regards to needs, I have never seen one of the existing buses at peak travel time, so that I don't know what the usage is at 
when people are going to work and when they're coming home. I have seen the buses at off hours. I've never seen more than three people on one of the buses. And most of the time, they seem to be empty. Unless there is a definite proven need for this, why is it being done? Or is the reason for doing it because money is available from the federal government or the state government agencies? But that's the reason. It's a very poor one as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Next is Kimberly Glyden, followed by John Brown. Hi, I'm Kimberly Gladen, and I live in the downtown core on uh, West Broadway. Um, I came tonight to talk about garbage cans and toilets in the downtown. I keep hearing people saying there are no garbage cans and there are no toilets, and I beg to differ because I'm downtown all the time, and we have a lot of garbage cans downtown. Um, some areas, some blocks have more than one garbage can in the block. I often see garbage next to the can, garbage all over the block. Um, granted, sometimes they're full. The cans between Willamette and Charnelton on West Broadway, I need to believe the city needs to empty twice a day. If you go by the corner of Olive and Broadway right now, you'll find all four corners are completely covered with spangers and a whole lot of signs that they left behind, and there's trash strewn all down the street. So it kind of needs more cleaning. One of the problems I feel with the garbage cans, though, is that the city, in its wisdom to make things look aesthetic and blend in, you've painted them dark colors and nice colors. And I feel this kind of makes them invisible to the general public because after eight years of the Bush administration, people are really stupid and unobservant. So the best thing to do, I'm going to suggest, is to paint them bright green, bright pink, bright yellow, garish as possible. I would much rather everybody complained about the garish garbage cans downtown than say there aren't any. At least then we know if they throw the garbage on the ground, they're just not looking and they're just doing it deliberately to be against the environment. Next to toilets. We do have toilets downtown. All the overparks have toilets. But people might not know that. So maybe we need a big green T on the building or maybe paint that wall bright green or something so that it can be seen for blocks. New York has Trump Towers. We'll have toilet towers could be a lot better and perhaps maybe even have a little map on the wall next to the toilet that tells where the other toilets are and what hours they're open so if somebody comes and sees a bathroom's not open instead of just <coughs> peeing right there or pooping right there they can see oh where's the closest toilet I can run to that would be a very good thing maybe even put out some guides and if that doesn't work well maybe have the toilets and the garbage cans text everybody who walks by saying, hey, here's a garbage can, hey, here's a toilet, and maybe that would get that in their mind. Because it seems like what people do is they have something they want to throw away or they have to go use the bathroom. They look around and say, oh, there's not one within one inch of my body. Gee, there aren't any anywhere. And just throw their stuff on the ground or just poop there or just pee there. Another thing is I see a lot of people peeing when they leave a bar. So maybe we need some old ladies standing at the front doors of the bars saying, did you go use the bathroom, young man? Go back in there and try, just like our moms used to, because it seems like people need to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. John Brown. Follow that, brother. You may or may not like what I'm going to have to say this evening. John Brown, for the record, I'm here as a uh, chair of the Eugene Water and Electric Board. Our interest is championed by Commissioner Cassidy, and that's to improve the communications and information sharing between our agencies. I plan to attend your public forums at least quarterly to share with you an update on the issues the, on the horizon for the E-Web Board. Several items this evening I'll share with you, but I want you to, each and every one of you to know that each one of our commissioners are available to you 24-7. Anytime you want to talk, we're, we're here. We need to t start talking more. Roosevelt Operations C Center, uh, the Rock is what we've called, is going to have the uh, open house on the 16th. And hopefully you've all received an invitation. And I'd like to personally invite you to there. And uh, the, the scripted notes say you've got to come and see our echo machine. I'm not going to tell you what it's about. You're going to have to see it. But uh, we didn't connect to the sewer. Um, rates in Carmen Smith, so, some of the uh, news that's uh, it's a fact. Uh, we're starting the discussion of rate increases uh, for next year. We're probably going to see another 7% on water. 
uh, next year. We have infrastructure, as you know, that's uh, that's breaking. The recent disruption on West 11th was just just the beginning of what's happening. That's going to equate to about a dollar and a quarter a month for the average residential customer. <clears throat> Electric rates, a little more serious. We're talking about four and a half percent, probably on the table for uh, May and uh, that's to we had a very low water year this year and we generate our revenue by the water uh, the, and the snowpack and when it's below where it is we don't make money and we're into our reserves already and uh, another five percent probably in November to uh, because of BPA uh, they're being de de controlled next year and uh, rates are going to go up we have no control over it when we purchase a vast majority of our electricity from Bonneville Power. When they raise their rates, we have to raise ours. As you know, that many of our rate actions in the last five years have been to lower rates, but now we're going to have to raise them. So next year isn't going to be a good year for the consumer. The, those two combined will t come to about $12.50 a month. Um, we're also beginning the work on our relicense of our Carmen uh, facility. That's our largest hydro project. It's $135 million that we have to do over the next five years to relicense that facility. We've also uh, adopted the master plan. We're in the process now of seeking RFPs for uh, the rezoning that will become coming before you shortly. And we're also relooking at the headquarters relocation and we're working collaboratively with the city staff to look at that and see where we're going to go from there. We're also considering uh, we only have a single source for water. If something happens to that, uh, um, this community is out of water. We have one place to get our water. We don't have a backup. We've got a serious problem, and we're starting to explore that. And lastly, I'd like to tell you that uh, Lane County is now considering two ordinances that are going to address water quality and riparian ordinances that is long overdue and long needed because there's thousands of septic tanks up to McKenzie that have been there since the 30s and 40s, and they are never inspected, and many of them are failing. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to close the public forum and um, just say uh, to start out with um, appreciate all the folks who um, came tonight. Actually, I appreciate your concerns for your businesses and uh, the tone in which you brought those, those uh, concerns to us. I appreciate um, the way you did it. Um, I'll be glad to be part of trying to get you some of the answers that you want. I do want to say that uh, LTD in pursuing MX in West Eugene is following council direction. In fact, a number of years ago, uh, we committed to building a full out MX system and the last time they came and asked us, where do you want us to look for the next leg of it, we told them to go look in West Eugene. And so they've been pursuing that and looking at a number of alternative routes to try to bring back to us what they think is the best um, best uh, route that we could be done in West Eugene. Um, we'll pursue answering your questions and look to trying to work with you to make sure that uh, we do value your businesses. Some of you may not be aware of this, but during the um, this recession, we worked on a lot of strategies to try to be really helpful. We tried to open the permit processes on weekends to do, uh, what is it, in one day turnarounds uh, to save money for folks. Uh, we really have been concerned with people being able to succeed and remain in business and we all fully, fully understand that small businesses are really the, uh, uh, what makes this uh, community work. So just want to We'll have a lot more conversations, I'm sure, but I, I just wanted to put that out to you. Um, and also, I appreciated Kimberly's uh, garbage and toilet conversation, and uh, appreciated the update from uh, eWeb as well. Um, very informative, and we appreciate you coming and sharing that with us on a regular basis and, uh, uh, and the communication. Councilor Pryor. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody coming uh, to speak tonight. Um, first item, uh, could we get some more information on Hidden Meadows, um, find out what's going on with that particular situation, uh, what, what is um, happening there? Uh, also, uh, I wanted to thank um, John for coming to talk about eWeb. Uh, I 
during the time I served on the McKinsey Watershed Council, one of the things that really impressed me was eWeb's participation in the monitoring that goes along the McKinsey River, and uh, they measure a whole series of different things, and I really appreciate your efforts with the county to try to get some control there. That, that really is impressive. Uh, and also, I wanted to thank all the folks from West 11th who came. Um, I have already met with one LTD board member. I'm meeting with another one tomorrow, and I'm planning to meet um, with another one. And as I mentioned, I'm working on getting together with you and the LTD general manager. Um, I think one of the things we've talked about before is answers. That is really what you're looking for. And I think uh, the degree to which I can help you get the answers you want uh, and need is really an important part of what we can do to ensure that we have good communication. Um, part of what might help there is um, I think you mentioned that you had seen the plan. Um, and that had influenced your decision on whether or not to put up a sign. It would be helpful if, if, and I can get with you later on, to get a copy of that particular plan that you are talking to so that I can carry that to LTD and can kind of go over that chapter and verse. And maybe you can direct me to where I can go to get a copy of that particular plan. Would be great. I would appreciate that a lot. So thank you all for coming. Councilor Clark. Thank you, Mayor. To, I appreciate everybody coming to to testify as well um, to the business owners on West 11th that came. Appreciate your, your being here. Um, I must say that my personal perspective is I'm leaning closer to the no build option myself. I have three reasons for feeling that way. One is because uh, the impact on businesses will be, in, in my opinion, far too burdensome. Um, based on what I've seen, there, there's a lot of work to try and mitigate those impacts on a case-by-case -case basis, but I'm a small business owner, too, and I work with them all the time, and I understand what that's going to do to people, and I, I think it's too much to have to bear. Uh, number two, I have a problem with the idea that, and it's just a philosophical problem with the idea that an unelected board can condemn property. That's a that's just a real problem for me. And I, the board members are all very good people that I like and respect very much. It's just the structure that I have a, a problem with. And lastly, I, I have yet to be persuaded that the cost of operations will decrease after this huge capital in, investment. And so I, I have some real concerns. And I, if I can be shown that the cost of operations goes down dramatically, I might get interested in listening a little bit more, but those are my concerns with that. Kimberly, I appreciated your testimony as well. As somebody with the downtown business, I, it always makes me smile when I hear at this table how we don't have enough bathrooms downtown because they're everywhere. And if you don't have the capacity to find one, you're not looking. Um, it always makes me smile too. Um, and then for staff, uh, at uh, Commissioner Brown's testimony here, he just gave us, I think, a clear indication of the strong possibility of rates going up even in this year. In doing so, that will affect our budget with the silt. And so I'm going to be looking for as soon as that happens, if not, you know, before they make a, a final decision on that, some estimation of the city's budget impact. How much more money will that mean in this budget year for the city of Eugene? What will it mean in the out years so that we're planning appropriately? Thank you. Councilor Taylor. Thank you. Um, Yes, I enjoyed Kimberly's discussion. I um, I thought there were no garbage cans to speak of. I spent <laughs> when I spent a couple of nights downtown with my dog. I I found where there were some. However, um, I'm very sympathetic to the business people on West 11th, and I think you made some really good points that we should be more concerned about. I which is something I've always said: more concerned about local businesses than about trying to recruit someone to come here from some other place. And um, I, though council did vote for that route, it wasn't a unanimous vote. I'm sure that I didn't vote for it. And furthermore, having voted for something doesn't mean that we can't change it, that we can't change our minds. A council is not exactly the same as it was at that time either. But um, I think you have some very good arguments. I think Robert Rubin should publish what he read. Um, that was well done. As And I appreciate John Brown's coming with the report from eWeb, though I don't appreciate the idea, the <laughs> prospect of rate increases, not only for the city, but for individuals. I, I wonder how many people are in threat of being in 
danger of becoming homeless because of utility rates. And I know there are people who maybe their income doesn't qualify them for help, but they've taken in other families, which makes the rates go really high, and there's no help. Um, it's, it's something we all ought to be concerned about, I think. But thank you all for coming. Councilor Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. I couldn't quite figure out why you didn't call on me. Then I realized I'd voted yes instead of putting on my request to speak button. Um, <clears throat> I want to start with thanking Kimberly to come down. I appreciate your words. I also agree there's a lot of amenities downtown that people could take advantage of. Um, Commissioner Brown, I'm just kind of curious now. We're talking about doing a land swap or selling some property, and yet you're going to increase the rates to the rate payers as a pass-through. That just for some reason doesn't resonate with me. Um, but thank you for coming. I appreciate seeing you. It's always a uh, pleasure to have you here. And I actually met this last week with a group of folks. Um, I want to call them the no-build EMX folks because that's the sign that's all up and down West 11th. And I appreciate you guys coming and sharing. Um, as I said at that meeting, I'm one of eight counselors. You see we all have different ideas. Um, Everybody pretty much said different ideas that are running through my head, and I understand there's a lot of concerns. Um, I'm glad to hear that Councilor Pryor is working on getting the general manager together with the group. Um, I'm surprised that that didn't that that hasn't happened without our intervention, um, and I don't know that it wasn't offered. So I, I'm just going to leave that. But I would just encourage you to continue to organize in whatever direction you want. Uh, it's part of the public process, and it's part of government is for you all as citizens and us as counselors, elected, your, your first line of local, affected, local elected officials to hear what you have to say. So thank you for coming down. Okay, with that, I think we're ready to move on to the next part of our agenda. Thank you again. Uh, the next item on our agenda is a consent calendar. Council President. Move to approve items on the consent calendar. Second. Moved and seconded. Any questions? Anybody in the queue? No? All right. Would you please vote on the consent calendar? Eight in favor, none in opposition. It passes. Thank you. The next item is the um, action on the Murray Hill land transfer. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. And I'll just leave, read a brief introduction. This applies to both of uh, the next two items, the Murray Hill land transfer as well as the Bethel Park D transfer. The first, the Murray Hill land transfer, is a relatively small land exchange, three acres, between the city and an adjacent property owner in the Murray Hill area of the Ridgeline Park system. Gene Code Section 2.872 applies in this case and outlines a process authorizing the council to rule on land not subject to other requirements. In this case, the AIS and supporting documents suffice as a presentation to the Council and the transaction description which they can authorize the City Manager to act upon. The second item is similar and addresses transferring property deeds adjacent to Bethel Community Park to School District 52 in accordance with a prior intergovernmental agreement. Thank you. Can we put a motion on the table, Council President? Yes. I move to authorize the City Manager to proceed with an exchange of land between Gordon Dorn and the City as described above and as shown on the attached map. Second. Moved and seconded. Any questions? Concerned? Okay. Ready to vote? Please vote. Eight in favor, none in opposition. It passes. Thank you. Um, as the city manager spoke about, the next item is the Bethel Community Park deed transfer. City Council President. Give me just a moment here. Move to authorize the city manager to transfer the Bethel School District all property rights in parcels 1 and 3 as shown on attachment A in exchange for Bethel's transfer to the city of all property rights in the parcel 2 as shown on attachment A. Second. Moved and seconded. Council Ortiz. So I just want to clarify for community and for myself, actually, I did read it, but I didn't read it, the, all the information really thoroughly. This isn't costing, this is a land swap. It's not costing the taxpayers any money. And it's, I'm assuming, to mutual benefit? I'll let Neil Bjork answer those questions specifically for you. Hi, Neil Bjorkland, Parks and Open Space. It's not actually a land swap. 
Um, we did a joint acquisition with uh, the school district, and we've jointly owned that property since the late 90s. Oh, okay. And this is just separating the ownerships into okay. their intended uh, uh, positions. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Would you please vote on that? Eight in favor and none in opposition. It passes. The next item of action is an ordinance adopting the updated Eugene Airport Master Plan. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. This item is for council action to approve an ordinance that would adopt the updated Eugene Airport Master Plan as a refinement to the Metro Plan. Following the joint public hearing on September 14th, staff pro provided revised findings to address energy conservation efforts at the airport in more detail and a follow-up memo to other questions and issues that were raised by councilors and county commissioners. My recommendation is to approve the ordinance adopting the updated airport master plan and we hope to have final action by the county board on this item tomorrow at their regular meeting. Right. Pastor Poling? <clears throat> yes. At the public hearing, I announced that I work at the airport. The city attorney's office has advised that this does not create a conflict of interest or even a potential conflict of interest for me with respect to the proposed plan and that I might participate in the council's discussion and action. For the record, I want to state that I can be fair and impartial with respect to this matter. Thank you. you Council President, you want to put it on the... I move to close the record and approve the ordinance at adopting the updated Eugene Airport Master Plan as a refinement plan to the Eugene Springfield Metropolitan Area General Plan. Second. Moved and seconded. Councillor Zelenka. I want to thank staff for being responsive to the uh, request for better information on Goal 13 Energy Conservation and listing out all the things that are happening at the, uh, at the airport mm -hmm. that regard, with regard to energy conservation like LED lighting on the runway and the, the audits doing at the, at, at the airport uh, building and all of the, and following um, lead leadership in energy and environmental design guidelines to build new facilities there. Um, I think that, that you guys have set a bar for how to respond to this particular goal, and I uh, hope that other um, in future analysis will uh, strive to do it equally as good job. Thanks. Councilor Brown. Thank you. Um, yes, I want to thank staff for um, answering our questions regarding energy conservation and the increase the possible potential increase in parking and the discussion. I want to thank LTD for <laughs> their thoughts on the bus service. Um, there's one one concern is missing, though. There's no discussion on the seismic uh, issues that I raised last time. I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering why, why not? Uh, because it seems to me like we're not addressing um, planning goal number seven. Uh, we didn't receive specific direction that I understood following the public hearing to revise those findings, so we did not uh, we did not formally change that uh, to the attachment uh, with the ordinance. Well, nobody asked you to to change the energy conservation or change the parking or immediately provide LTD service. We we were just asked for more. Did. You did mm -hmm. well to change the parking and and the LTD. I mean, you know, we asked for information. Part of it was an informational. Um, uh, the re the reason I mean you know I don't want to make too big of a deal of this because I think it's a very good plan overall and I, I would support it except for this one this this one provision which I don't think I can support the plan because I think that you're not um, I don't think that you're meeting goal seven. Um, there is a there is a known definite seismic rif uh, risk with that facility and you're not addressing it. And you're actually kind of compounding the, so there's a misunderstanding of the type of earthquake that you're describing here we don't have. That's not the threat. The threat is, I mean, there are earthquakes like that, San Andreas Fault type earthquakes, but they're in Eastern Oregon. They're not in the Willamette Valley. The one we have to worry about is the subduction zone, in the, you know, that's off, off our coast. It runs for 600 miles. The whole state is, will be affected it's a continental plate going underneath the other one, and that's that's the type of that's that's why that the airport is below life safety standards. 
why the, um, you know, the terminal building. Just uh, this one is too. <laughs> All the city hall is is way but is the worst. It's way below life safety standards. So, I was just wondering why. I don't. I mean, that should. I believe that should have been addressed, and I, I won't be able to vote for this. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, did you have any more information for us, Commander? No, I'm just looking through um, the goal seven there, um, and I, I don't think this helps because I know you read through that. But what the part of what that is is that the plan addresses new items to be built, and so as new items are built, of course, they'll be built to current earthquake standard and current code, so they will be um, built to the the code to address those issues. It, the plan doesn't. And Gabe, you can correct me if this isn't right. Doesn't contemplate the re um, rehabbing of existing structures. So the plan is really about future capital projects, not retrofitting existing. Is that generally true? Can I answer? And, and uh, well, goal I, seven. The, what we want to look at is what regulations we have in place to protect um, the health the safety of those and you know with this airport plan we're not amending or changing any of those provisions that we have specifically put in place to make sure that we have those protections and so um, like we said for new construction all of that will be addressed but goal seven is about getting regulations and getting those things in place to make sure the development that occurs is protected not about rehabbing existing buildings well, yeah, so that's great. So what you're saying is all new buildings are going to be built to current standards, but forget about the main terminal, which is below life safety. I, I, I guess I just don't get that. Um, okay. The federal government has programs that would probably pay for it. It seems like to me like it should be in the plan just to check it out and get another assessment. Now, if the report that the city has from Conda and So, you know, is no good, then maybe we should know about it. But I, it just, I, I'm not real thrilled with the response, and I, I won't be able to support this. Councilor Zelenka? I think, Councilor Brown, if you wanted to ask specifically for uh, a memo about the earthquake safety or earthquake standards of the existing building, I think that would be an appropriate thing to ask, and I'm, I would second a motion for that, um, and I think staff would be happy to bring you that information. I think it's just a matter of asking the right question. <laughs> okay, I think we're ready to vote on the um, on the motion that's on the table. Would you please vote? Seven in favor and one in opposition. It passes. Thank you. Um, next item is the adoption of City of Eugene naming policy. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. The Council is asked to consider and formally adopt the City of Eugene naming policy. The intent of the policy is to guide the naming of city-owned facilities in a fair, objective, and consistent manner and aid in the selection of names that are suitable to the property or facility, respectful of the history of the site or area, useful to the public in locating the facility, and reflect prevailing or emerging community culture. The document in front of you tonight includes all of the changes requested by the council at the May 19th work session. Okay, thank you, City Manager. You want to put the uh, motion on the table? Thank you, Mayor. I move to adopt the City of Eugene naming policy. Second. Moved and seconded. Councilor Pryor, did you have something that you wanted to say to this one? Yeah, I just needed a clarification. I was looking back at page 2 of the policy. It is page 116 of the packet, and I noticed at the very top uh, criteria for considering individuals' name for both new and existing facilities. Yeah, and I, I, I interpret this as being the overriding paragraph for this whole section, and it says, the City Council may consider naming a facility after an individual who has been deceased for a minimum of one year as of the date of submission and and um, the and who meets at least one of the following criteria and it gives a whole list of criteria further down in about the lower third it says if the proposed name recognizes a living or deceased person I don't know how you could recognize a living person if the overriding paragraph says they have to be dead for a year 
that's we just wanted to make sure the council knew they had the ability to name something after a, a living person as well but that you're, that that is kind of the overriding criteria but it's not a requirement the only that, that's why I'm asking it is me you could interpret this as a binding paragraph that says it will only name it after an individual who's been deceased for a minimum of one year. It doesn't say may name or it says may. It says may. May consider naming it. So. May rather than shall. Okay, okay. That's why I sought clarification. I, I wanted to know that we weren't being overly bound by this, and if may is sufficient, then I'm cool. Okay. That, that's all. Thank yes, you. you are. Councilor Taylor? Um, I, <coughs> I think the policy is. Well done, but I do think, I, as I said before, that we should have a policy against renaming anything. And uh, I don't see that choice here. I saw something about that. Yeah, I, I think it, it was, it's only um, should be considered in cases where a person may have, you know, new information may have come about the person that maybe puts them in a different light. But there, there are some, I think, some uh, on page three. It, it states um, and renaming may, will only occur when a facility has a generic name or in recognition of or response to evolving political, social perspectives, and sensitivities. Um, the council will not rename facilities or existing facility spaces which have been previously dedicated in honor of an individual unless such individual no longer represents a lasting legacy to the mission of the city of Eugene. It's kind of the Yeah, I got that, but it doesn't say that there won't be any re it doesn't say that there won't be any renaming. It's only if it's just named like Centennial, for example, which was not named for a person but was named for an well, event. You're right, and it would just go through the process then mm -hmm. that we have set forth. Um, yeah. That would be one of the things you'd need to consider is whether the. Well, I'd like to make a motion. I'll just try this, that we do no renaming. Is there a second? Seeing no second. second. Oh, who, you're seconding, George. Yes, I am. Oh, okay, Councilor Brown seconded. Um, Councilor Pryor, did you want to speak to this? I could, I, that, that was actually what I wanted to do. Um, yeah, the reason I would I would actually speak um, to this motion and not support it is there actually was an incident within my memory where a stage was named after a um, a music teacher at a school, and um, with great pomp and circumstance. And then a number of years later, it was determined that that teacher had abused children or at least in court, it was determined that that teacher had abused children and had a history of um, uh, not good behavior with students. Um, it was then uh, decided to rename the facility because the person had a criminal record as a sex offender and they didn't want to have a stage named after them. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I think the policy that Councillor Taylor just proposed would have prohibited that. And while I don't support the use of that particular renaming option, just arbitrarily, there may be an extraordinary circumstance where you might want to be able to do that. But I would not be renaming facilities to the highest bidder. And I think in that spirit, I, I, I would not want to just be renaming facilities. But there may be a circumstance under which you might want to have that provision. Hey, I think we're ready to vote on that concert. Oops, you, oh, all right. Sorry, didn't, they just popped up. They weren't flashing. Sorry. <laughs> she had her yes vote on. <laughs> I don't see those. Sorry. <laughs> Councillor Zelenka and then Councillor Ortiz. Well, in uh, Section 2 actually talks about, uh, Section 2A talks about renaming, and it said in the preamble to that, it says the council will not rename facilities or existing spaces which have previously been dedicated in honor of an individual. And so it's a will not. It's not a may. It's it's a prohibitation against renaming facilities that have been renamed unless circumstances like Councilor Pryor were brought up. Then it also has renaming of city owned facilities, which has six parts to it, and renaming of streets, which apparently Beth is already codified in section nine point eight four five five seven nine point eight four seven five. And so that 
to to change that would we have to change the Eugene code I I will let Catherine look at that but the intent was that this policy the naming policy Attachment would work with the street naming policy so if there was an occasion where something like Centennial renaming of Centennial came up um, there may be a much more robust uh, process mm -hmm. for council to get involved in financial implications social implications right. all of that would be explored right and there's almost a whole page on on that and then an entire code with uh, multiple sections about renaming streets which is attachment a of this this um, packet so I think we've got a long uh, or an already established process for this for renaming streets but also this adds to the renaming of city-owned facilities and I think what we've got here is good and adequate Councilor Ortiz well I just want to speak a little bit to um, I'm glad to see that we have the ability to rename streets. I think our uh, the face of our community changes, not to be disrespectful of those who came before us, but I think there's times like the centennial um, conversation that happened before I was on council and that motivated me to get on council um, <laughs> that I think is necessary. Um, I think that, you know, as community changes, demographics have changed, things that are of importance to people. The city, you know, one of our goals is to be reflective and inclusive and in order to do that I think we need to allow people to own different segments of our community if there's an opportunity for them and if it doesn't cost us arms and legs and not everybody has millions of dollars to give not everybody can be you know acknowledged for that but there are huge contributions that people have made to this community and to the world that at some point in time we might want to if, if there's an opportunity um, acknowledge them well, that's why we're tr trying to put some really good guidelines in place because I can tell we could have a really good conversation about that right now. So, <laughs> did you have anything update you found, Catherine? In no, I think it was covered. It, 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 it is addressed in the city code about how, and there is some state law regarding it. it needs to go to the planning commission. So, but it, it's very well covered in the in the policy, and it's even included as an attachment. So, you're right. Good. So, would we have to change city code in order to pass this amendment? It would need to be, you would still have to go through the process of what the code allows. If you wanted to make it so nobody could, uh, you could, you would never consider an application to rename a street, you would have to change the code to say that. Okay, would you please vote on Councillor Taylor's motion? One in favor and seven in opposition. It does not pass. And with that, I believe we are through with it. Nope. Nope. We got to vote on the main motion. Oh, bet main motion. Right. All right. Please vote on the main motion. Eight in favor and none in opposition. It passes. So now we're ready to call it a night. Thank we're you all to sneak very out much. Of here. Is that what you're trying to do? Yes. Good job. Mary.